Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Thursday, 8 February 2024. It is the 135th anniversary of the birth of Siegfried Krakauer, who was born in Frankfurt am Main in, on this date in 1889. Krakauer is not particularly well known. Some will know him as a film critic in Weimar, Germany. But there is one posthumously published work on history, history, the last things before the last, which was edited by the noted Renaissance scholar, Paul Oscar Christeller. In the introduction, Christeller wrote this about the book and about Krakauer, quote, the present book does not attempt to provide a philosophy or methodology of history in the form of a systematic exposition. We may rather consider it as a series of meditations on some of the basic problems involved in the writing and understanding of history. He tends to criticize the general theories of history formulated by Hegel and Nietzsche, Spengler and Toynbee, Kroos and Collingwood, and to disregard the theories of Heidegger and of the analytical philosophers. Krakauer is more inclined, and I tend to agree with him, to listen to the practicing historians, to Ronke and Heusinger, and especially to Burkhardt, to Droysen and Maru, to Piron and Bloch, to Butterfield, Kagi, Hexter, and Kubler. Krakauer is a keen, cri <clears throat> keen critic and a good quoter, but in both criticism and approval, he is guided by his own insight. His masterly critique of Kroos's present interest theory of history has become once more timely, as is his critique of Nietzsche or of the current infatuation with social history, unquote. And to this, Christeller added, quote, I profoundly agree with the spirit out of which all this work was written. I want to draw attention in the initial passage I quoted to Krakauer's use of the term the practicing historian. We find this a lot, the practicing historian or the working historian. So here's another quote from Krakauer. Where he also mentions this. Quote, somewhat vague as Ronka's theoretical observations usually are, they have the advantage of resulting not from a pottering about with a set of abstractions, but from his undiluted experience as a practicing historian, unquote. So how does Krakauer pull off the trick of writing a philosophy of history while exhibiting his preference for the practicing historian at the expense of the philosopher of history? Good question. We can get some of the flavor of this approach from Krakauer's quote of Jakob Burkhardt near the end of the book. Burkhardt, who by the way was a friend of Nietzsche, like Krakauer has an ambiguous relationship to the philosophy of history, which comes out in this passage. Quote, Burkhardt's dealings with philosophy and theology testify to the same ambiguity or fear of the fixed in which he in which he resembles Erasmus. Of philosophy of history, he remarks, it is a centaur, a contradiction in terms, for history is coordinating and hence non-philosophy, philosophy subordinating and hence non-history. And of Hegel in particular, he says that this brisk anticipation of a world plan leads to errors because it starts out from incorrect premises, as we are not privy to and do not know the purposes of eternal wisdom. Yet, in spite of these misgivings, he cannot help philosophizing a la Hegel on occasion and recognizes a relationship to Hegel as in a passage noted by wind. All the same, we are deeply indebted to the centaur, and it is a pleasure to come across him now and then on the fringe of the forest of the historical study, unquote. Krakauer never clearly explains, at least from what I could find in the book, what he means exactly by fear of the fixed. I'll come back to that later. But it seems that Krakauer, like Burkhart, wanted to have it both ways. Krakauer wanted to dispense with Hegel, but he wanted to keep him too. Abstractions are the enemy, but we might need them, so we hold them in reserve. Or if you're Heideggerian, you hold them in the standing reserve, and then you make sure you put bestand in parentheses so everybody knows that you know the German original of the term. One way to do this is to the appeal to appeal to the figure of the working historian or the practicing historian, whose happy eclecticism allows him to keep his concepts while si simultaneously disavowing them. In a 1985 paper 
philosophy and its historiography, Chris Steller, once again, the editor of Krakauer's posthumous work on history, wrote, quote, philosophers who claim to explore the status of historical knowledge have written about general laws of history and about causal explanation. These topics may concern the philosophy of history and also the sociologist or anthropologist, but they are speculative and derivative and at best marginal for the practicing historian or philologist, unquote. Here you can see the work of the philosopher of history is being set aside as marginal to the work of history itself. Presumably the historian is doing real history and not the, 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 the soi-disant history of the philosopher of history. You can, and we can easily, easily imagine a, a no true historian argument being made on this basis since no true historian employs philosophical ideas in his work. But there are a number of philosophers of history who urge us to consider the work of the practicing historian in just this way. They are worried about losing themselves in a thicket of specifically philosophical quarrels that have little apparent relationship to history. And this is, of course, a perennial criticism of philosophy, implying that specifically philosophical inquiry is somehow illegitimate. We've all heard that philosophy bakes no bread and fine words butter no parsnips. It's in the same spirit as that. This perennial criticism of the philosophical impulse also finds expression in other philosophical specializations other than philosophy of history. For example, in philosophy of mathematics, there's an entire school of thought that focuses on mathematical practices and erects the figure of the practicing mathematician or the working mathematician in contradistinction to the mere philosopher of mathematics. This development was made explicit in the 1998 collection of papers, New Directions in the Philosophy of Mathematics and Anthology, edited by Thomas Tomasco, who unfortunately died tragically young. In the introduction to that anthology, Tomasco wrote, quote, the philosophy of mathematics can be begun anew by re-examining the actual practices of mathematicians and those who use mathematics, unquote. So on this basis, we could reformulate a precisely analogous way of talking about historical practices so that the philosophy of history can be begun anew by re-examining the actual practices of historians and those who use history, or if you prefer, those who read or write history. So we can posit a school of historical practices analogous to the school of mathematical practices, which tacitly exists as a school of thought in the philosophy of history. And that is why I am belaboring this point to make to so you understand that there's an underlying school of thought here that the, 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 the legitimate way to go to study philosophy of history is to examine the work of the practicing historian. This idea has been kicking around for a while. Henri Baer, who was something of a precursor to the Annals School in France and who himself formulated a research program in history, wrote, quote, Studies in theory will perhaps abound to begin with, but unless we repeat ourselves, this is a vein that will not be slow to exhaust itself. Furthermore, the word theory should not be given, should not give alarm. It does not presuppose, it absolutely does not presuppose vague, excessively general speculations put forward by thinkers who have never been working historians, unquote. There is a... There was a symposium held in 1962, Philosophy and History. These are the proceedings were edited by uh, Sidney Hook. And a entire section of the anthology is uh, devoted to, quote, the problems of the working historian. So there's three papers. Some Problems of a Working Historian by Leo Gershoy, Relativism and Some Problem of Working Historians by Ernest Nagel, a well-known analytical philosopher, and The Problems of the Working Historians, a comment by Bernard Balin. <laughs>
So this appeal to the working historian is attractive. I understand where it's coming from. It distracts us from the philosophical problems while getting us little closer to solving this problem, but it feels good to appeal to the authority of the historian who's actually doing history. But it has problems, as implied by Ernest Nagel's contribution to the Hook volume. Nagel wrote, quote, when historians do express themselves on philosophical issues, usually on ceremonial occasions, they are likely to voice philosophical ideas imbibed by chance during their school days or in their desultory reading, but which they have sel seldom subjected to rigorous criticism in the light of their own professional experience, unquote. I personally think that philosophical problems, or should say specifically philosophical problems, are great fun, and I'm not about to abandon them. Uh, nevertheless, any approach into a given discipline, whether history or mathematics or something else, is worth considering. And an approach based on the actual practices or practitioners of a discipline is an equally valid uh, point of entry um, compared to any other way of going at it, even if you come at, or you know, the other option being coming at it from a primarily philosopher's point of view and not much bothering with, with, with the practical uh, practicing historian. So I welcome a philosophy of historical practices uh, in, or, or a philosophy of practices in any body of knowledge, whether it be logic or archeology span or some other area of knowledge that philosophers have studied uh, for its theoretical interest. We aren't forced to choose between philosophy of history and a philosophy of historical practices. In my previous episode from earlier today, in which I compared the work of Christopher Hill and Pitarim Sorokin, I took examples from both of them to make a point about historical taxonomies and the need for a scientific approach to historical knowledge. So I am myself responsive to what practicing historians say and do. Christopher Hill was a practicing historian and had very little to say about historiography or the theory of history or certainly philosophy of history. But I also have a philosophical perspective that I want to bring to uh, history. And this philosophical perspective is not entirely satisfied with a purely historical approach. After recording my previous episode on Hill and Sorokin, I realized in an account that in a counterfactual history in which a robust conceptual framework for history had been constructed, when Hill was writing his book that I quoted, A Century of Revolution, 1603 to, 16, 1603 to 1714, it could have been written very differently in light of existing taxonomies, of which we don't have them. But so, for example, Hill could have said something like, the French model, better known as civilization of type X, and the Dutch model, better known as civilization of type Y, were both attractive for different reasons during the 17th century social unrest and political agitation of the established such and such type. But England was transitioning from Z sub one to Z sub two type of society, and French model X and Dutch model Y could be of only limited utility as social models under that circumstance. Since it has been demonstrated, the, <clears throat> since it has been demonstrated the, that civilizational templates must be modified in their implementation on societies with an indigenous civilizational tradition, and the French and Dutch models fell outside the well-known parameters of templatization that would have resulted in a submerged indigenous English civilization, it's uh, it's not going to work well. So it has to it has to be um, the 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 English civilization as the basis of, of the account. So obviously, Christopher Hill didn't write anything like that. And some historians and their readers would find history formulated in that way, appealing to all kinds of you know theoretical terms and taxonomies of history, off-putting and not history at all. <clears throat> 
If a truly scientific school of history ever appears birthed out of the womb of the philosophy of history, I suspect that traditional narrative history will continue to be written par in parallel with a new school of theoretical history, which latter is only readable by specialists in the discipline. And we will continue to have a philosophy of history, that is to say, a philosophy of traditional history, including those who deny the possibility of a philosophy of history, which I've called non-philosophers of history, as well as having a new philosophy of theoretical history, specifically addressing the problems of theoretical history, and maybe even a substantive philosophy of theoretical history and an analytical philosophy of, of theoretical history. So it's obvious that philosophy of history is so far from exhausted that forms of philosophy of history can be clearly formulated that haven't even yet appeared. In all of this, there's an important philosophical problem buried. When we have a concept like history or a concept like mathematics, it's highly general, and a truly novel permutation of the concept appears, do we expand the meaning of the original term so that both the original conception and the novel conception fall under the umbrella of the newly expanded concept? Or do we create a new discipline so that the original history, which we could call H sub one, uh, has in addition to it, a new form of history, theoretical history, H sub two. But then we have to posit a new concept, a new more comprehensive concept which we could call, say, meta-history, if that hadn't already been used by Hayden White, under which would fall H sub 1 and H sub 2. We have an example of this in history with the appearance of constructivist mathematics, but there is as yet no consensus on the status of constructivist mathematics in relation to traditional mathematics. It's still historically a recent development. Uh, constructivist mathematics began in earnest in the 20th century. So it's still, you could say, playing itself out. And we don't know if there'll be going forward one tradition of classical mathematics that doesn't place any particular stress on constructivistic methods and another school of purely constructivistic mathematics. Earlier, I mentioned the eclecticism of the traditional historian who doesn't need to worry about his um, metho methods and who keeps his abstractions while disavowing them at the same time, which is a you know convenient place to be in relation to your, to your ambiguous theory. The late Torkel Franson, who like Tomasco also died young and with whom I briefly corresponded, coined the useful term classical eclecticism to cover the attitude in classical mathematics, where you don't worry too much about the methodological tools at your command. Similarly, the classical historian can maintain a similar eclecticism, or rather the future classical can, historian can do so when faced with the methodological tools of a theoretical history. But history hasn't yet been developed to this extent, and theoretical history remains, remains a mere twinkle in the eyes of its expectant practitioners. In any case, I've gotten rather far afield from Siegfried Krakauer's philosophy of history or non-philosophy of history, as the case may be. A couple of pages on from what, uh, what I quoted above from Krakauer about the fear of the fixed, Krakauer made another comment that I think was uh, intended to somewhat elucidate this. Quote, because of their generality and concomitant abstractness, Philosophical truths tend to assume a radical character. They favor either or decisions, develop a penchant for exclusiveness, and have a way of freezing into dogmas, unquote. I don't entirely agree with this, and I don't entirely disagree with this. Part of the radical character of philosophical thought is making explicit the assumptions and presuppositions hidden within ordinary thought. So part of the function of the philosophy of history is the making explicit of historical presuppositions. And part of the function of the philosophy of mathematics is the making explicit of mathematical presuppositions. Sometimes when you make implicit 
presuppositions explicit, it is a disturbing experience. And we would rather leave the assumptions buried since we, when they are, when they remain buried, we aren't bothered by the implications of what is being suggested when it is made explicit. A radical philosophy of history shows how traditional philosophy, or I should say, can show how traditional philosophy can go off the rails by making presuppositions about traditional history. And I think this is a valuable service. I think we should try to get at those presuppositions and make them fully explicit. And not just that, but show the logical development of these concepts to show where they may lead, as disturbing as it may be. So if you like, count me as a radical philosopher of history, even as I wish a happy birthday to Siegfried Krakauer. Thanks for listening.